Thanks very much for inviting me. Uh, I think it's important before I start to say two things. One is uh, that I have been to Leeds with this presentation a few times in the past. So I gather that you did say to people who'd heard it before um, that, you know, maybe they didn't need to come. But if you have heard it before, hopefully it'll uh, improve on repetition. Um, the second thing is um, that although it's just me speaking today, it's really important to um, acknowledge that this work is born out of a great deal of teamwork, uh, uh, particularly uh, based on a project, a very large child welfare and equalities project that was led by Professor Paul Bywaters um, and Kate Morris on the qualitative side, who I think many of you will know here in Leeds for her work on FGCs. Uh, so, very important to say, I'm just representing a whole pile of people who've done a huge amount of work in this area. Okay, so poverty, child abuse and neglect. Uh, we have found over the last five years uh, through doing this research that, uh, interestingly, poverty has become uh, a quite a complicated subject for us in child protection and for those of us interested in child welfare and child neglect and it was not uncommon for us to hear many times during the course of our research and during the course of our presentations that really poverty had nothing to do with child abuse and neglect or that the other thing which upset us greatly was when people said to us you're actually stigmatizing poor people and you know many most people in poverty bring up their children very safely and very well and actually your research is part of pathologization and uh, i hope today that we'll be able to interrogate both those uh, ideas i one that it doesn't have anything to do with child abuse and neglect and secondly that by drawing attention to its undoubted contribution in our view we are actually seeking to understand and challenge and make things better for children and families rather than contribute to the undoubted shaming of poor people okay i always start with this quote um, and it's from martha nussbaum she's a uh, a philosophy uh, professor uh, in the States and I think the reason I start with it is partly because people have often said to me I don't know why you're talking about this subject it's got nothing to do with the the things I deal with in families uh, because for me I think it's really important and maybe for the social workers in this room not necessarily maybe but uh, this might link with some of the stuff we understand about the way in which the the outer world the social becomes part of our inner world the way in which how we experience what's happening out there the big picture around how the world is organized how poor people are treated how people from particular backgrounds are treated how that just doesn't stay out there and just doesn't isn't just part of our wallpaper or our landscape but actually enters our very hearts and souls and psychologies and produces often uh, as Martha Nussbaum says when we see injustice it doesn't necessarily make us nobler it can make us angry resentful bitter and can actually uh, as I'll argue later on is not the source of ennoblement or the source of good behaviour. But often when we perceive, unjust, perceive that we're being unjustly treated, it can make us very un, uh, angry and resentful. And what she's saying is if we understand how important injustice is and what it can do to people, then it gives us a deeper incentive to understand why children need the material and social support uh, that human dignity requires. So it's a, a, just a plea at the beginning for us to start to think about how uh, we, we shouldn't just think about things that's happening over there in politics and then things that happen in people's homes as to do with psychology. The two, as I hope I'll show, are very, very interlinked. Um, so what I'm going to talk about are uh, defining poverty and inequality. Then the major part of the pro, uh, the presentation is on Child Welfare Inequalities Project, uh, which was a large research finding, uh, project, and I'll talk about the findings and the implications. Since we actually finished the main bit of it, we have really literally traipsed around the four nations of the UK, talking to social workers, talking to families, uh, talking to multi-agency groupings like today, and we have learned a great deal about um, how people see the world, and hopefully some of that will come in, particularly at the end when I'm talking about what we're trying to do. Because for us, as I Academics, it was really, really important, and I can't stress this enough, not just to do this piece of research, but actually we, uh, we found, thought it was imperative that the research did make a difference. So we've spent a lot of time on impact. And then finally, I will come and address, because I think it will set up our discussions uh, for after the break, I'll uh, address what we call the elephant traps in this area. The, it, well, it doesn't cause abuse. You're, 
you're excusing bad behaviour, uh, you're just letting people off the hook, etc. So I'll, do, I'll look at those in detail and then I'll set us up for some uh, exercises after the break. Okay, so as we, you probably know, uh, poverty is very contested and actually it's not just actually contested politically. We have found through talking to a wide range of people that, uh, that there's a lot of dispute amongst all of us about what exactly is poverty. A lot of people will say to me, well, there's no such thing as poverty in this country. You, you know, if you look at, say, somewhere like Africa or India, there's, there's no real poverty in this country. Uh, we also have politicians who say to us who want to redefine pol uh, poverty and say, well, it's not about how much benefits we give to people. It's about their behaviour. It's about what they do with their money. Uh, particularly around drinking and smoking and, take, and addiction. Duncan, uh, Ian Duncan Smith's argument is that uh, he wanted to redefine po poverty in terms of people's behaviours. But there is a lot of debate within our society and I will argue a lot of anxiety and shame and anger about poverty, both against people who are poor and, and within uh, people who are poor about uh, and we'll come back to that but it's it's very contested it's also emotionally very complex and I think that's partly why um, there's not an awful lot of research often done about it because uh, we found across when we looked at the, the literature across the world we found that every country no matter how rich or how poor it was in an overall sense that people who were in poverty according to the uh, in indices in that country they were, felt very shamed of being in poverty. Shame is a crucial aspect of poverty. Depending on the country, they were also made to feel ashamed. So people themselves felt shame, shame about, be, about not being their parents, about not being able to give their children what they felt they needed, shame about not living up to the kind of standards that you would expect in a society and maybe the standards they had felt that they should uh, grow up with and the hopes and dreams they had for themselves. But also, uh, particularly in this country, but other countries, they were made to feel ashamed. Ashamed, uh, anyone who's watched I, Daniel Blake, would, will recognise some of the ways in which people who have to go for uh, to the job uh, secrets or for universal credit or whatever or struggle with how they're treated therefore I think and this is one of the issues you might want to talk about is how do we talk to people in our work about uh, their income how do we raise issues with them about poverty uh, and how can we access their true feelings about what's going on for them so that might be something we will come back to okay uh, Peter Townsend uh, at the, for, made the definitive definition uh, that is used by loads of the different organisations when he argued that actually it was about resources, it is about whether people can obtain the type of diet, participate in the activities and have the living conditions and amenities. This is the bit that's really crucial though, which are customary or at least widely encouraged and approved in the societies in which they belong. He act, was arguing against the idea of absolute notions of poverty, i.e. the people are in poverty if they have a certain amount of income. He was saying it's more than that and I think most of you in the room probably would say that it actually is definitely clear when you talk to children and you talk to parents about the fact that their children can't go on school trips, that a lot of people in Leeds are already dreading, well will have been for quite a while, dreading Christmas, dreading what, uh, what, what their children will want, but crucially how their children value themselves against other children in their classes. I mean we've now reached a situation in this country where uh, teachers uh, don't no longer in many schools ask their kids what they did in the school holidays because it's actually too problematic, it's too difficult because there are so many children in their classes who will maybe have had very have had a terrible school holidays and will probably not even have had the school meal they're used to when they're at school. So it's something about relative and customary and it's uh, linked to the idea that actually uh, it, I think I've got on this slide. Yes, it's linked to the idea that yes, of course, Maslow's hierarchy of needs really, really is crucial. Uh, having enough to eat, having heat, having a roof over your head are absolutely central. But actually accompanying those things are uh, how you, what, what right you feel you have to participate in society, who talks about you, whose voices are heard, 
what are the relationships between people in society? And I know that uh, Leeds Children's Services last week had the first ever conference where the majority, the old speakers were parents. Uh, and uh, I think that that's a really, uh, really important, crucial shift. And in our research, we've spent a lot of time working with parents in poverty. So it's about getting people who themselves uh, are in poverty to to uh, tell their stories rather than to be talked about or to have their stories told. So it's something, there's, so poverty is crucially linked to respect and human rights and dignity. And it is absolutely not just about money. Um, Amartya Sen, who a uh, Nobel Prize winner um, economist, has done stacks of the work across the world on poverty and looked at loads and loads of countries in a comparative sense. And he has argued that shame is at the core of poverty. And uh, as I say, it's not just about how people feel, but crucially linked to it is how they are made to feel. Um, as I've already said, I think it's really important that we have a psychosocial approach to poverty. It is rarely ennobling. It can damage people and contribute to, as well as produce a range of social problems. And that's why the crux of why it's important for child protection. Because for people trying to raise their children safely, uh, it's, it is about money. It's also about the neighbourhoods they live in. It's about the access to uh, help they have when they run out of money at the end of the week, uh, the safety of uh, poor neighbourhoods, uh, and the general sense that they have about being respected, being regarded, being, being uh, valid members of society. So it is crucially linked to good parenting, and um, we'll come back to that. So the, these... I, I just put this down. In fact, uh, I should have updated it, actually, but uh, I've put the links there. You know this stuff anyway. We've been on a very sad story, a very sad journey about poverty in the last 10 years. You know, uh, we now know that there are poverty leavers that can take children. 800,000 children were lifted out of poverty between 1998 and 2011, and that was through a combination of uh, leavers on the part of policy, uh, uh, credit, tax credits, working tax credits, uh, minimum wage, all sorts of things happened. Uh, yesterday, though, I read that, um, this isn't a party political point, but if we don't change course, uh, we, will, uh, we will have uh, poverty rates of something like 60% of children uh, in the next 10, 20 years. We, we, we really are in a really bad place in relation to poverty. Uh, the other thing is that uh, we've had huge changes in uh, the benefit system uh, on the premise that work is the way out of poverty. And we are constantly told, and this is part of the shaming thing, we are constantly told uh, by key people that actually if you want to get out of poverty then you work and you get a good job. But we now know that work does not provide a guaranteed route out of poverty. Two thirds of children growing up in poverty live in a family where at least one person works. Now you can present those statistics till the you're blue in the face to many people but unfortunately if you have a frame and this is where values are really important and again I hope that we will have a chance to talk about that in terms of how we work together as organizations if you have a frame that really clearly is part of your personal frame which is that nobody needs to be in poverty in this country and that it is primarily about the uh, their hope their aspirations and it is primarily about their ability to work hard, then I can tell you this forever and you'll just go, sorry. Bec uh, and that's the way our communications work. If you have a frame, however, that says, actually, we don't give people a fair deal in the society and that some people are born, and I hope our research will provide more help for you to think that, uh, then you will understand that this uh, is about the fact that we have made certain policy decisions as a society which have been quite disastrous for families. There is room for things to change at a local level and cities are trying to turn this around uh, and we will talk about that, but, the, but you do need national levers to uh, really impact. As I've said, it's not just about poverty, however. It's also about the nature of the society in which you live. Uh, inequality itself matters, and there is work by Wilkinson and Piggott. And by inequality, I mean the gap within the society, the income level gap between the rich and the poor. And some, in some societies, it's very small. People are more or less the same. 
Not every society, and not many societies rather, and there are very few societies that are completely equal. But there are societies that are much more equal, where there isn't such a gap between the rich and the poor. And in fact, again, uh, until the late 70s, uh, aft from after the war, uh, England became quite a reasonably equal society. It became a society where there wasn't such a gap between uh, rich and poor and along the way. According to Wilkinson and Piggott, who are public health specialists who've done work across the world, they would argue that actually inequality, how unequal a society is really matters. And this is a quote from them which is really stark. I don't think it's quite as bad as that. I think we all know that even in many communities that look very uh, forlorn and abandoned, that you will find ties of friendship and care and kindness. But it is true that uh, levels of mental health, particularly among young people, uh, anxiety, self-image issues, uh, crucially about how we see ourselves and how we feel we are perceived, uh, depression about our status, uh, this thing about being worried about how others see us, uh, I'll explain more about that in a minute, but that has become a really important issue. And it's not simply about social media, although social media has fueled it. It is actually about the whole values and the way our society is organized. Um, they argue, they've looked at a whole range of societies and they've mapped how equal or unequal they are. Uh, so how, how much there is a gap between people. And they have collected data on health, and a range of social problems. So we're very used to hearing about health. We're very used to hearing about the fact that uh, people in one uh, uh, arena of society will live 10 years earlier than people in another part of society. And we know that there are big health inequalities, but there are also big health inequalities in, men uh, there are big inequalities in mental illness. Uh, places, uh, towns like Blackpool will have the very high rates of depression, but also of uh, use of medication for depression. Drug and alcohol addiction, there, there are health inequality, there are inequalities, and there are also much higher rates in societies like the US and unfortunately societies like our own England. Uh, life expectancy and infant mortality, we've already seen life, uh, these, some of these figures from a position where they were getting better starting to go back down. Obesity, so all the things that we worry about as a society. There is a very strong link between these social problems and how equal or unequal the society is. It's actually about the differences within the populations. And you might be thinking, well, what has that got to do with anything? What is kind of how the gap between the rich and the poor and the gap between different levels of society, why would that matter in terms of how people feel about themselves and whether they drink too much on a Saturday night or not? How could that make a difference? Uh, just. Um, they argue, and they've developed it further in their new book called The Inner Level. They, they, use, uh, they argue that as human beings, we are social animals and we spend a lot of time comparing ourselves with other people. And we, we're very um, vulnerable to, how, to, to social comparison. And they argue that inequality within a society gets under the skin of individuals. And in societies, and this is not about romanticizing other societies, but in, in societies where maybe you have a strong uh, religious value system or you have a strong uh, kind of social, um, social equality ethos, where people feel much more in it together, they feel they're much more part of the society and they feel they're much more um, uh, kind of like in common with each other. Uh, people are less anxious about how other people see them because they, already know they have a place in the society. However, in highly individualized, competitive, unequal societies where wealth and consumerism have become really central to how people uh, uh, see their self-worth, these are tendencies and these are trends. It doesn't mean that there aren't many of us who resisted, there aren't many of us who choose to live in very different ways, uh, there are people who choose very ecologically sustainable lifestyles, there are people who, cha who are very religious, there are people who draw their sense of self from other people. But that in broad sense, and we're just about to see a minority of it now at Christmas, in broad sense, in very individualistic uh, societies where there is uh, a huge emphasis on consumption, where there's a huge gap between rich and poor, where people do not feel part of the society and do feel uh, very divided from each other. Uh, actually, what happens is people become very anxious. And there are different ways in which people deal with anxiety. People either internalize it and uh, turn it in on themselves, they self-medicate, 
uh, they manage the pain through drowning out, or of course we have high rates of suicide. Uh, in, yeah, so greater inequality heightens anxieties because it increases the importance of social status. The social position becomes a key feature of a person's identity in an unequal society. When I read this stuff first, uh, it was like um, a light bulb moment on one level, but there was also a bit of me thinking, surely these things that people feel about themselves can't be just about the level of inequality in the society. But the more I've read about it, the more I've thought it's about what that symbolises, what it means when people feel that the society isn't organised in a respectful way for them, when they feel, uh, and I think um, without getting at all political about this, perhaps we've seen some of this in the last year with some of the divisions around uh, Brexit, etc., where people feel that the society is very unfair and uh, that there are uh, very big gaps between themselves. You know, we see it in, uh, there's a p thing in the paper today about the way from IPPR North, the think tank, about <coughs> what's happened in terms of the North-South divide and how inequality has really risen in the last few years between different parts of the country. Uh, it's simplistic to see it in terms of the North-South. Uh, I've done quite a bit of work in London. There are bits of London where people are living cheek by jowl with uh, enormous inequality and it is feeding deep anxiety, anger and resentment. Um, so the implications for child protection, uh, uh, it's fair to say Wilkinson and Piggott don't talk about those particularly, but they do talk about how the general quality of social relationships is lower in un more unequal societies. And they showed how inequality was linked to poorer physical and mental health and more substance misuse. It's not a great leap then to think how life in a more hierarchical, mistrustful society might affect us in our personal lives. Domestic conflict and violence, and there is, I'm, I'm just, just started, Leeds are part of it, I've just started a big project on domestic abuse, massive driver in child protection, as we know, uh, and the research evidence on uh, poverty, economic stress and strain, how that impacts upon relationships between families, between parents, is really enormous, and we haven't been really dealing with that. We haven't been bringing that in, because our gaze has been, uh, for all sorts of understandable reasons, our gaze in the child protection world has been very internal. It's been on attachment uh, patterns, it's been on parenting capacity in a quite a narrow sense, not looking at what fuels drug addiction, not looking at what fuels mental health problems, not looking at what fuels domestic abuse, we've been looking at their impact upon the children in quite a narrow, rationalistic way. And we'll come back to that. Okay, so this is the study that we did uh, across the four nations of the UK and led by Professor Paul Bywaters with, as I've said, Kate Morris, uh, Will Mason, uh, Bridget Daniels, who then, at that point was at Stirling, Jonathan Scarfield at Cardiff, Lisa Bunting in Northern Ireland, Naman Mirza at Stirling, Jardine Brady at Coventry, Callum Webb at Sheffield, and Jade Hooper at Stirling. So we got money from the Nuffield Foundation. Uh, we also did a literature review where we got money from the Joseph Rowntree Foundation. And we set out to look at the relationship, a literature review on the association between poverty and child abuse and neglect, CAN. We also then, this was the um, new part of the study, we actually, and this is the bit I'll spend a little bit of time on, we looked at the relationship between child protection plan, looked after children rates and deprivation. And I'll explain that methodology and what we were looking at. We were looking at uh, whether uh, where you lived in terms of deprivation uh, had anything to do with whether you were likely to come into care or to be subject to a child protection plan. And then that's a kind of what big picture stuff. And then Kate Morris led the case studies which looked at the interplay between family circumstances and social work decision making. Basically, she and Will and other colleagues went around talking to social workers about poverty, what they thought it had or hadn't to do with families, observing a case conferences, decision-making, looking at records. Okay, so in terms of the evidence review, this is not a great slide, I'm really sorry about this. Um, shouldn't make these slides so fussy. What we found was, there's not lots and lots of evidence across the world actually, because we haven't been looking at this very much. We haven't seen it for the last 30 or 40 years, unlike for example in my own profession, which is social work, where we used to talk a lot about poverty and we used to talk a lot about housing. We were central actually to the development of campaigns around housing and the emergence of organizations like shelter, etc. But we've stopped talking about poverty in the last 30 or 40 years. But the, the literature that we found, we found there was a strong association between families' social and economic circumstances and the 
that their chances were, that their children would experience child abuse and neglect. Now, that's not a comfortable finding for a lot of people. As I say, it really bumps up against the idea that uh, it's not about poverty and that you're stigmatizing people. But actually, we would say now that children are more likely to experience child abuse and neglect uh, if they live in poverty. We don't think it's a necessary or a sufficient, uh, according to the evidence, but it is a risk factor. It's a crucial risk factor. Evidence of this association was found repeatedly. So. Uh, Wherever, I mean, unfortunately, a lot of uh, literature reviews, including our own, are limited to more English-speaking literature. That doesn't mean it's just English-speaking uh, countries, because uh, many, con many academics publish in English anyway. But we looked at a range of countries, we looked at types of abuse, because lots of people would say to me, oh, I can get it for neglect. But what about sexual abuse? I can't get it for that. But we looked at types of abuse, definitions, measures, and research opportunities as far as we could, approaches rather. And we also looked at the kind of different child protection system, because many of them are different. The way we organize things is not the way that's organized in other parts of the world. So we looked at more family support type systems. We have a very rigid child protection system. Uh, 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 and we can talk about that if we want. And we found though that evidence of this association was found repeatedly and this is the really interesting one in the states particularly in the us uh, because they have a federal system or a state system uh, sometimes they have different social policy system uh, measure me, um, sorry uh, social policy uh, developments in different parts. So, for example, uh, families will get a bit more money in one state than another. And what we found, interestingly, was that in where families' income was raised, it had a statistically significant impact on rates of child abuse and neglect. That is quite interesting. Just giving people a little bit more money actually reduced rates of child abuse and neglect. And that really poses some issues for us, actually really poses some issues for us about uh, when we invest in endless parenting programs for people, why aren't we just putting a bit of ch uh, Citizens Advice Bureau help into our local offices? Why aren't we spending a bit of time talking to families and doing a, health, a, bit, a financial health check with them? And where, we, uh, where, where people have done since, as a result of our research, where people have started to do that, where local authorities have started to do that, they have started to see some uh, uh, impacts, some helpful impacts. Uh, the evidence review concluded that reducing child poverty was likely to reduce the extent and severity of child abuse and neglect. That's quite a stark finding. We know actually from Kitty Stewart's work at the LSE that um, reducing child poverty and increases children's <coughs> welfare generally. So that's a broader, that's not about child abuse and child protection or child abuse and neglect. This evidence review is free to download if you want to read it. Um, so it's on the website, that's the link there. So if you want to um, have a look at it. Right, um, I won't spend a lot of time on this because I'm just noticing the time. Uh, I've already said we need to talk about uh, equality. There is a gradient in the relationship between family, social and economic circumstances of rates of child abuse and neglect. What we were trying to get at there, and you'll see it more in my next slide in terms of interactions, is that there, I think governments often like to think that there are these really uniquely stressed problematic, troubled, troublesome families over there. And then there are the rest of us who cope, the deserving versus the undeserving. Actually, uh, for every step level in deprivation, you increase rates of child abuse and neglect. So uh, as we're seeing actually with austerity. Uh, so it's not simply that there is a group of people over there, a group of families that we need to provide child protection services for, and we don't need to worry about the rest. Changing uh, what we're doing has implications all the way across society. So why do these things matter? Well, an obvious thing is material hardship or lack of money to buy and support. And uh, we are seeing, uh, particularly with the move to universal credit, we are seeing really big challenges for families waiting for money, having to manage the five weeks. We're, these are families where they're not always able to borrow from their friends or their own families because their poor families are often enmeshed in networks of other poor families and poor friendships. So we're seeing people people who are really, really struggling, as we see with uh, food banks, the growth in uh, food banks, and we're seeing uh, because of precarious housing and because of uh, precarious work contracts. We're seeing people, re and there's an early intervention foundation have been doing some good work on this recently, again, in terms of parental conflict, the impact of 
uh, material hardship on and people arguing over money and worried about money and uh, the impact. But of course, the indirect is uh, is as crucial, which is around stress and strain and worry. And we're all familiar with the idea that uh, you know children can't concentrate in school if they're um, if they're hungry. Well, I suppose what we would argue from the work we've done is uh, why would we expect parents to concentrate in a parenting program if they're also hungry? Uh, and what the other thing that is really important to understand, and I mean, you probably I'm probably teaching granny to suck eggs with a lot of this, but just to uh, kind of reinforce the point is it's not just, in, in some of the early work we've found from other academic researchers, poverty was just seen as like almost a background factor. It's there, it's like just passive. Actually, what we found is it, it's implicated in all sorts of ways in the decisions that people make every single minute of the day. Do I take the bus and spend the three quid on that, or do I keep it for their lunch money? And, and you know, we live in the part of the country, well, I do anyway, and I don't think Leeds is that much different. I live in uh, Calderdale. Bus fares are incredibly expensive. Um, things like, you know, and this is important actually, because if you're a mother on her own with kids, one of the things that's going to make your life harder is if you do feel lonely and you feel lacking in social support. So being able to, there's a lot of research now that looks at the, the, the Trussell Trust came out last week with an, a very good report on the use of food banks, but it was much broader than that. They actually looked at the impact of poverty on loneliness. And we know that loneliness is really bad for people's mental and physical health, but we also know that people, parents who are lonely, are going to be struggling to make good decisions for their children and to good, make good decisions with their children. And poverty is implicated across the piece in loneliness and in lack of social support. Okay, so this is the big study we did. We looked at the rate of child protection plans and looked after children uh, across, well, we looked at the four countries, but I'm only going to talk about England today. And we look, this was per 10,000 children. Now, why did we choose deprivation proxy? We would have liked to study the relationship between parents, social and economic circumstances, and their chances of a child coming into care. Don't worry if this doesn't make any sense to you in a minute, It'll, it will. Uh, uh, but we weren't able to because no government, including the one in England, collects data on the social and economic circumstances of the parents of the children they take into care, which does seem strange to us, that we take children into care, but we actually don't gather any evidence on whether their parents were working or not, whether they were receiving universal credit or not, no systematic data. So we can't say whether parents going into work is a protective factor for their children, etc. What we had to do was use a proxy, which is area level deprivation, which is a methodologically robust and uh, you, universe, uh, you know, it's a, it's a recognised measure of deprivation. It's about the dep deprivation of the area you live in on the grounds that pe people who live in an area of deprivation are likely to be deprived. And what we found is that one over there, number one, is the most affluent bit of the country. So that's where, that's the Kensington and Chelsea's of this world. So we found that a child living in, in, in some of these very affluent areas was a, a child protection plan, 8.8 .8 per 10,000 children were on a plan, 14.7 were looked after. If we go over though to look at a child in the most deprived bit of our society, look at what we're, we're talking about children being over 10 times more likely to come into care or to be subject to child protection plans. Now, if um, we go back to the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, we will see already that there are huge inequalities in children across our country in children's ability to spend time in their families safely within their neighbourhoods and communities that they are, uh, and, that, and to, stay, to spend their childhoods rather. Uh, and so we are, our systems are focused on people in this bit. We're rarely over there. We're rarely over in the affluent bits. And when we are, we panic and we put on our best clothes and we consult legal. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so uh, and the reason that this is quite important, is very important, is that before that, and even since then, you know, we've had policymakers say to us things like, well, it's about thresholds, or it's about the quality of practice leadership, or it's about the, the model you're using. 
if you use systemic family therapy, you won't, you know, that's why Kensington and Chelsea are so successful. And we're not saying that any of those things aren't important. What we're also saying, though, is poverty and money matter. They, and I will show you in a minute how they matter in all sorts of ways. These are the key headlines. Children in the 10% most deprived small neighbourhoods in England are more than 10 times more likely to be on child protection plans or looked after than children in the least deprived. So it's part of a bigger picture of inequality. They are the children whose parents will die earlier. They are the children whose parents will be likely to be struggling with mental health problems, with substance misuse problems. And there is a massive level of social inequality in where these things cluster. So, there is a social gradient. Each 10% increase in neighbourhood deprivation brings a 30% increase in a child's chances of being subject to child protection plans or looked after. So it's like a ladder. So what the quantitative bit, and I could go on about that, we did loads of work, very interesting research. In Scotland has huge rates. Uh, uh, Northern Ireland has low rates. In, every, in all the four countries, every every country we found the association between deprivation and a child's chances of coming into care or being looked uh, being subject to our systems however we found there were really big differences between the countries so scotland had very big rates nor northern ireland given how deprived it is had low rates and we've been looking at that and i can talk about that later if you want to in terms of what we think possibly might be going on so i suppose a key thing is Money matters for families. Increasing levels of child poverty and therefore family poverty are impacting upon the quality of life in, in families and increasing stresses and strains and increasing the chances of uh, children experiencing abuse and neglect. Money matters for practitioners. We've done quite a bit of work on this. Who, where did the cuts fall? And you, you know this already. The cuts have not fallen equally since 2010. They have fallen on the most deprived local authorities. And the difference is between 21% cuts in deprived local authorities versus 4% in the, in the richest local authorities. So, um, the, though, and the, the whammy of that is that it is the most deprived local authorities that of course have the highest demand and they've had the least, they've had the most money cut. And it has made a huge difference. Uh, these are trends. I'm not saying that they apply to Leeds. They are, these are trends. What we've found is that people have had to make, uh, local authorities have had to make very tough choices about what, how they spend uh, the less money they have. And we have seen a massive shift in funding. In 2010, it was 50-50 more or less, 50% on looked after children and statutory, child, uh, not statutory, but you know, child protection proceedings and that end of the work. But 50% on family support and uh, all those kinds of early help type work. We're now seeing uh, it's 70-30 and 30 is probably an overestimate in some places. Budgets have been decimated, uh, particularly in poorer local authorities, and the money that is being spent is being spent at the top of the cliff, rather than, you know, it's been, sorry, it's being, it's being spent when people are falling off the cliff rather than in stopping them getting there in the first place. And this is an interesting one. Uh, this was done before Ofsted suddenly uh, started to put out, give out a lot of uh, outstandings in more recent years. But we found that it was not, it's not that it wasn't possible for poor local authorities to get a good uh, rating, but it was much harder and they had to spend a lot more money per child. It was much easier for authorities that were richer to get outstanding ratings. And we've, uh, I can give you references for all that. We've mapped ratings versus deprivation levels. We have talked to Ofsted about this and they are looking more at their methodology in that sense. Okay, I won't spend much time on that. Uh, High deprivation local authorities have higher, this, but this might be of interest to you. High deprivation local authorities, i.e. poorer local authorities, have, have of course higher rates of intervention as we've already said. However, when you look at neighbourhoods in local authorities that are affluent versus those that are deprived, children, poorer children in more affluent local authorities are likely to come into care more. Now, there are all sorts of theories about that. Do they stand out more? Have, low, have the richer local authorities, uh, because they've got more money, do they intervene more, etc. But we might want to talk about that. They have more money to spend though. And I've already said that. Okay, so uh, actually just, so that just gives you headlines, but it raises as much questions as answers. And it's, uh, it's you know, uh, 
yeah, it's interesting, but it tells us, gives us a snapshot as well. It's not longitudinal, it's a snapshot. Um, and if we took poverty seriously, we would be collecting this data year on year and looking at trends. We'd be really looking at trends because there have been big increases in uh, child protection uh, interventions and looked after children that have spiked around the deaths of baby Peter, et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, but we haven't been looking systematically at the role of deprivation in these things. Okay, we then went and uh, we had, I think it was eight case study sites in England and Scotland. Work has been happened since in Northern Ireland, although I probably won't talk about that because I don't know it as well. First of all, we've already said this, uh, Social workers go to the poorest parts of local authorities and work there every day. And it's unremarkable and unremarked upon often. This is what we found in the case studies. People just accepted that's what they did. And as I say, the only time it was ever disrupted is if they did have to go and see an affluent family, which prompted, a, oh God, better talk to legal about that. They'll know their rights or maybe I better think about what I'm wearing or whatever. But it was out of the ordinary. Um, one of the things though that was poverty was there, it was all around people, all the time. Uh, but it wasn't really, we coined this phrase called, it, be, it seemed like it was the wallpaper of practice. It was unremarkable and unremarked upon. Uh, when, we taught, when we said to people, what do you think about the relationship between poverty and harms? People could say, oh God, yeah, it's really, it makes it much harder. Often, some people didn't agree with that, but people would say, oh yeah, yeah, of course, people living in poverty are going to struggle. But we also got people saying, well, you could give them a million pounds and they wouldn't change the way they behave. Uh, so, but, but even if it was only a small bit of the jigsaw, even if people said, oh, well, you know, do you know, it won't solve everything, but it might help with blah. We rarely found, however, any reference to poverty or to issues associated with poverty in case planning. What we found incidentally, uh, endlessly were formulaic responses and uh, th these local authorities, uh, incidentally, were, you know, Leeds wasn't one of them, you know, they're, I can't tell you where they were, but you know, I'm not talking about Leeds, I'm not talking about Leeds, because <laughs> I don't want you telling me afterwards, it's all different here. But I just want to say, you know, we found, uh, we found parents being endlessly sent on parenting programmes. Or, being, or people being uh, endlessly sent on particular interventions that were f fashionable in particular areas. But we rarely found evidence of somebody sitting down and doing a financial health check with somebody. We, we are, this is a terrible slide as well. I've already apologized to Jenny about this. I need to break these up. Our analysis suggests that existing frameworks cannot address the core issues for families. What we, and I've very, I'll, I'll show you this quote actually, and then I'll come back. So this is a quote that kind of summed up for the difference between core issues for the workers and core issues that there might be for the families. We do a lot of signposting of families to food banks or where we can issue food bank vouchers. But if we tend, if we can, we are more than fully committed doing what we would consider our core business, which is doing parenting skills, parenting capacity change type of things. Now, when you think about what impacts upon parenting capacity, Domestic abuse, substance misuse, uh, uh, kind of stresses and strains. What becomes apparent here is we're not asking the questions behind the behaviour. We're not asking why. We're looking at the behaviour and we're addressing the behaviour and we're not looking at why. Why is this behaviour? And this other stuff, while it's in a perfect world, we should be doing it and doing it with family. The reality is that the workload people would say, you need to be doing other things, getting other people to do that sort of thing. Uh, you, can't, you haven't got the capacity, and if you do it, you run the risk of drowning. So basically, social workers were both saying, look, it's not our core business. We will do it if we have to, but it's not our core business. And moreover, they were told it wasn't their core business. So this is not about blaming social workers, this is about recognising that we've developed a way of thinking about what, uh, protecting children which is very individualised, which is very lo located in uh, what parents do or don't do in the very immediate sense, how they deal with their children in the here and now, rather than a more investigating why they might be feeling what they're feeling. So to go back to that, so uh, they don't see it as core business, but why, why, why has this happened? Well, first of all, and we totally understand this, social workers said, well, it's not our, it's too big. 
This is what the government do. This is too big for us. We're just trying to get it by. We've got huge caseloads where if all our resources are gone, uh, we're a poverty-stricken profession, many said to us. We've got no resources ourselves. How can we deal with the lack of resources on the part of families? The overwhelming scale and complexity of unmet need and the hollowing out of family support services was a uniform response across all the sites, actually a uniform experience. I've already said this, that uh, services that we can be a bit formulaic. Um, what we do sometimes is we, we tend to import services from, oh God, uh, so so and so is doing signs of safety. Oh, we'll bring in signs of safety. Oh, so and so is doing triple P. Oh, we'll have triple P. Oh, it's evidence based. Oh, it shows it works. Whatever, and that's all right on one level. But actually, it's not very rooted in thinking about. Um, well, you know, if you think about the differences between places in this country. I, this wasn't one of our case study sites, but I do a lot of work in places like Barnsley. Um, Kate and I have been doing quite a bit of training there. Barnsley is somewhere that has a whole history, a particular history because of the collapse of the mining industry, a whole history of what's happened to it. It's quite different to working with parents in Camden. You know, experiences of deprivation may be very similar uh, psychologically, but the contexts are quite different. And one of the things that we would argue is that we've maybe become a bit wedded to routinized programs that we bring in and import rather than sitting down and saying, do you know, what, what's the bus service like in Barnsley? If you're a mum living in one bit of Barnsley, how easy is it to get in to get your uh, benefits checked, etc.? Uh, we found rather than doing an analysis of what was going on, the availability of the services or the fashion fashionableness of the services shaped and constrained the social work analysis. This was another one, and again, we have to own, uh, take, you know, hold up our hands as social work educators, because clearly we've been doing something really, really wrong here too. Because what we found as well was some social workers were saying to us uh, things like, well, we know lots of people here are on um, zero hours contracts, and we know that, work, that the only work they can get is in the Amazon whatever, down the road or whatever. Uh, but we don't discriminate against people. We don't ask about that. We, we treat everybody the same. As if by asking about people's different circumstances, it was discriminating. Kate talks about it as a moral muddle, that we've got into a moral muddle around what anti-discriminatory practice looks like. And the other thing is that uh, it was more likely in some of the deprived local authorities that we went into that the social workers did know the area better and that maybe they uh, lived near it uh, or they had grown up in it and they were better connected with the area. In some of the more affluent local authorities, we did find social workers drove in in their cars to work every day. They used their sat navs to negotiate where they were going to visit and uh, they didn't really, and, and with some, a small number, they made it a point of pride not to really know the area. You know, they, they kind of said, oh, I just go to those streets and, uh, you know, I get away. Um, again, it'd be very interesting in the discussion after the break to talk about what that means in Leeds, where uh, people have different relations, what, what the relationships people have with space and with the communities in which they're working. And this is really important when we think about assessments. We're assessing for neglect. We're assessing for well, why people are or aren't feeding their children properly, why they are or aren't getting them to school on time, why they are or aren't uh, clothing them properly and looking after their emotional needs. And th they're very rooted activities. They're very linked to the resources that are available to people. Uh, we found some fantastic social workers. We found social workers who absolutely were working their socks off to try and make things better for families and we found no social workers who didn't want to make things better for families but we did find that some of the systems we've got involved in were reinforcing the shame and the suffering of poverty for families and the the um, st the example we gave um and i will finish with a good example on this but the, the example we gave we gave is the father who went to a meeting where the recommendation, I mean, before the meeting, he'd already told the social worker that he had no money for his bus fare at home. And uh, before, uh, the recommendation of the meeting was that his child was going to be adopted. Uh, that was a recommendation and of course, obviously devastating. He was in floods of tears. Uh, and he then had to go around everyone after the meeting asking for the bus fare. And he was directed to a building where he would fill in a form and he might get his bus fare. And you know, it's that kind of thing that actually 
you know, is rather inhumane, really. So I've already said this. So very quickly, I've, sorry. Uh, there are three things that we constantly come up against. There are more than three, but these are just three things that I wanted to flag up before the break. Or should I stop and do whatever you want? <laughs> the coffee won't be ready till eleven. Okay. <laughs> Okay, right. Well, what we can do is I'll go through these and then we can talk about these. I'll leave them up and we can talk about them after the break and there is an opportunity then for you to do some work. So shouldn't people take responsibility? This is one thing that's really important in terms of neglect. We found there was a bit of a tipping point sometimes with families where uh, they were seen as deserving up to a certain point and then they tipped over into risk and suddenly... Uh, the kind of holding and understanding a responsibility and what they were and weren't responsible for is, went out the window. So I want to talk about that one. I've already mentioned that, but I'll come back to it. And then finally, of course, the thing is, if we're trying to understand these things, are we justifying them? And there are these things that we get into a muddle about, all of us. So we recognise there is a danger that we're being far too simplistic and that we're substituting what we could call an underdog story, which presents those who experience poverty or inequality as just unable to take any agency or responsibility for their own troubles. Uh, and we profoundly worry about that. We, we know as researchers that getting people to take responsibility for their lives is crucial to being a human being. It's absolutely essential that, you know, and I give this example all the time, it's just a simplistic one, but if you have a friend who, every time you want to meet her for a coffee, she's late, there's always some excuse, uh, what you start to feel is A, she doesn't value me, and B, she's not taking responsibility for managing her own time, and why can't she be honest about how the expectations that she, uh, you know, honest about her um, commitments. Um, so we do think, and that's only a simple example, but of course people need to take responsibility for their behaviour. We expect it every day in our workplaces that if people say they're going to make a phone call and then they don't, we expect them to take responsibility for why they haven't. If they say to us, I really, really wanted to make that phone call, but you know, X, Y and Z happened, we will understand, we will try and make sense of it. We don't blame people immediately if they don't um, take responsibility, if they don't do what we want them to. What we think is, though, it is problematic when we expect individuals to resolve problems for which they cannot reasonably be held responsible. And again, the example I would give to you here is you're a dad in London, uh, you've recently got leave to remain in this country, you've a terrible credit history because uh, you haven't been in this country, you're on a zero hour, you're on a minimum wage job and your contact with your children is excellent, your attachment relationships with them is excellent, but you can't find a house in which to house them, uh, three children. It, it, that is not evidence of your lack of commitment to your children. That is evidence of the fact that London has a crazy housing market and that you are living in poverty in one of the richest cities in the country, in the world rather. And, and, and that's, this is, that example is not from our work, but it's from another uh, piece of work that Anna Gupta did. So, but it's a good example of what can we reasonably be held, and that's something I'd like us to talk about. What can we reasonably expect people to be held responsible for? If uh, kids are always late for school, is it that mum can't be bothered getting up? Or is it that she has three kids and they're going to different schools and the buses are all kaput? I know I'm obsessed with buses, by the way. I use public transport all the time. And in fact, get me on trains and we'd be here all day. Um, so I think there's something there that we might want to talk about because I think we've got a bit confused in our professional practice about responsibility and what we think. And we've got confused as a society actually about it because as a society we've been told endlessly for the last 30 years that we should understand a little less and condemn a lot more. That's the message we've had from governments, successive governments. The second one is there is a difference between direct and systemic causation. When we say to an infant or a child, a toddler, if you put your hand in the fire, it will get burnt. That's direct causation. And it's true, it will get burnt, unless you're very lucky. However, most of social things in our lives are not directly caused. So when we say poverty does not cause child abuse and neglect, yes, it doesn't, but it is different then to say, but it's a contributory factor. It's part of the jigsaw. There are very few social issues where there's one even health issues, I mean, I'm somebody who smoked, and I know that um, smoking causes lung cancer, but I also know that not everyone who gets 
and not everyone who smokes gets lung cancer, and I'm hoping that that's going to be right for me. It may not be. But what I'm trying to say is that there are multiple causations for lots of things. It's systemically, there are systemic causes, and that's what we want to get across. It's not it's the only cause, but it's a piece of the jigsaw that we haven't been uh, addressing as, as professionals and as safeguarders. And finally, are you saying that poverty justifies violence or neglect? No, we're not. We understand it. We understand that people are saying to us, you know, you're just making excuses for people and you're just justifying terrible behaviour. You should see some of the cases I have. But we do think that we're confusing what we're trying to explanation with justification. And this is again, this is from Andrew Sayer, who's written a lot about uh, economic crises and financial bad behaviour by bankers, etc. He argues that much behaviour lacks moral justification. Much of what we do, you know, when we have, when we eat too much or tell little fibs to get ourselves out of trouble, you know, most of us tread some moral fine lines a lot of the time, unless we're very good, or maybe it's just me, you know, we just kind of fiddle around with things. But it, but a lot of our behaviour is made more or less likely by particular circumstances. It's, it's easy to be good when you have a lot of good things around you. You know, you're not actually that fantastic if you're able to behave well when you have loads of money and a partner who absolutely loves you in a beautiful house. And in fact, if you're being bad, then I would say, that's terrible, what's wrong with you? <laughs> An under-regulated financial, this is his example, it's just one. It doesn't justify uh, irresponsible actions that risk uh, crashing the economy. It wasn't the lack of regulation that made the bankers behave badly but it made it more likely. So it's that kind of, and it's kind of big philosophical questions, but of course, Robert Dingwall, 30 years ago, did say that child protection was not about checklists. It was not about tech, technical fixes. He said, and that that's the challenge to us, he said child protection, and I wish I had the quote with me, he said child protection is about what is a good society, what, what, how can we support each other to live well and to flourish, and crucially, how can we support the most vulnerable in our society? So child protection is about big moral questions. Uh, it's not about uh, kind of like programs and techniques. So, and I, we think, uh, as a research team, that poverty is a big moral question that we need to pe pay a lot more attention to. I think that's got references there. Yeah, so I'm going to finish there.